how we will proceed. We will begin with uh, an uncontested block of vote on legislation. Uh, these are bills that are either identical or very similar to bills that have been dis discussed or considered in the House. Uh, I would note that any member that has a bill that would like to be extracted from that block can do so. I know we have at least one that will come in that fashion. From that, we will turn to legislation, again, that has been identical or at least similar, if not identical, in the House, but where there was a split vote. And we will take up individually so members, uh, if there are members here who wish to uh, cast a no vote, it will be simpler on that score. We will then sequentially have the reports of the subcommittees one, two, and three. Uh, the subcommittee chairs will be presenting those. Uh, and then at the end, there are two pieces of legislation that uh, do not have any uh, companion in the House, and they will be taken up at the end. Uh, so with that, by way of uh, description, any observations or comments from the committee as we get underway? Hearing <coughs> that, we will begin with the uncontested block vote. I'm going to simply describe the bill, uh, na uh, name the number, uh, and I'll mention the House version of it. If you have questions or want to take it out of the block, please uh, let us know we'll do that. Uh, the first is Senate Bill 875, which is identical to House Bill 1478 that Senator Borak had. This is on the exemption from recordation tax deeds and trusts given by utility consumer services and properties. This passed the House 99 and nothing. The second bill is uh, Senate Bill 886, the gas severance tax. This is identical to Delegate Killian's. House Bill 2169, Bill likewise, <coughs> 99 to nothing in the House. Senate Bill 934, uh, Senator Wagner is uh, on the uh, legal tender coin for sales and use tax exemption. It is similar to uh, Delegate Stolle's House Bill 1668. Again, it passed the House 99 to nothing. Back when we were shorthanded, uh, we were delegates. Senate Bill <coughs> 1018 Senator Barker. Uh, this is identical to Delegate Ward's House Bill 1529. Likewise, passed the House with a unanimous 99 to nothing vote. Senate Bill 1033, uh, Senator Howe, notification requirement on breach of payroll data. This is identical to Delegate Keene's House Bill 2113, and then the Ministry of the House passed 95 to nothing. Senate Bill 1034, I believe we're going to take out of the block Delegate Blossom uh, to conform, so that will uh, take out of the block for consideration. Then Senate Bill 1248 uh, is identical to House Bill 2219, Senator Stewart's bill having to do with a deferral on real estate, real property tax in Stafford County. Uh, Delegate Duden have to House Bill 2219 passed on a vote of 95 to 1. Before we do uh, take the block vote on this, I do note that on Senate Bill 1033, Senator Powell, there is a, an amendment, and I believe that is at your desk. Yes, it is at your desk. Um, this was uh, the patron intended to include this. We did include it on the House side. Uh, but for whatever reason, it was omitted from including it on the Senate side. So I would uh, first accept a, a motion to adopt that amendment to Senate Bill 1033. So a motion and a second discussion. <coughs> and yes, Delby Keene. Yeah, yeah, just modify that. Yeah. And Delby Keene, if you could use your. Uh, I think this is the, the desk that has the mic that's broken. Can we do that on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to bring my megaphone next time. Uh, Mr. Sherman, uh, this is the uh, companion bill to the bill that I carried that uh, dealt with the uh, data breaches and the notification. And uh, by the time the Senate committee had moved its version, we discovered that there was an amendment to that we needed to narrow the scope even more, and which is the reason why the Senate version does not include the language that we adopted. So by adopting this amendment, it would now conform with our version. And I'm hoping that uh, the version that I have in front of the Senate Finance Committee this week will also keep it identical as well. So. Time we get to the floor, the both versions will be identical. Further discussion on the motion to adopt the amendment to Senate Bill 1033. 
Those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, all right, that is adopted. All right, then we have uh, continuing on with the block vote, uh, Senate Bill 1274, this is Senator McDougal. It is identical to uh, Bill Hugo's House Bill 1889. Um, this is a clarifying uh, matter on local license tax for certain defense production businesses. It passed the House 93 to 1. Senate Bill 1308, also Senator McDougal, is identical also to Delegate Hugo's House Bill 1890, having to do with uh, collection and sales sales and use tax on certain uh, construction items. It passed the House on a vote of 95 to nothing. Senate Bill 1438, Senator Norman, has the uh, tax amnesty program. It is identical to House Bill 2246, Delegate Jones, which passed the House on a 94 to nothing vote. And finally, Senate Bill 1576, patron by Senator Hanger, is identical to my bill, HB 1814, which extends the tax credits for worker retraining and telework expenses uh, to the year 2022, and that passed the House on a 95 to nothing vote. Those are the bills that are in the block. Uh, any discussion or questions from members on the <coughs> bills that remain in the block? Hearing none, uh, I will entertain a motion to uh, so move. A motion to adopt the block second and the second. Discussion. Members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine. Right. Have all the members voted? The clerk will close the roll. Block vote passes unanimously. The vote is 19. All right, we turn then to bills where there has been some, there have been some negative votes cast uh, in the committee. And so we're we'll putting the block, they are coming out separately. Uh, the first is Senate Bill 962, Senator Hanger. Uh, and this is identical delegate Watts to, uh, to your uh, House Bill 20. Having to do with the nexus for out of state business. This is the bill that uh, was, there was some discussion on um, the fact of uh, certain anti business entities having a nexus in the Commonwealth. And uh, I think we all have been familiarized with the issue. Are there discussion or questions on this? Uh, Chair will entertain a motion on Senate Bill 962. Move to report, Mr. Chair. Motion to report. Second. And a second. Discussion on the motion? Hearing none, members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine. Clerk, tell, close the roll. Senate Bill 962 reports on a vote of 12 to 7. All right, not, uh, the next is uh, Senate Bill 982. This is uh, Senator Stanley, and he extends the sunset date of the motion picture production tax credit to the year 2022. This is identical to Delegate Robinson's HB 1665 passed the, the House 80 to 14, <coughs> one abstention. Uh, is there a motion on this? Report. Motion second. and a second to report Senate Bill 982. Discussion on that? All right, members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine. the roll. Senate Bill 982 reports on a vote of 18 to 1. Senate Bill 1390 is similar to House Bill 1913 Delegate 
Anderson's bill. This was the one you, you may recall. We had very extensive conversation about this uh, <coughs> as a measure that came out of the Crime Commission dealing with uh, the resale of cigarettes and penalties for people who are attempting to elude uh, oversight in the Commonwealth on this question. Uh, it does say similar. on that motion. Hearing none members in favor of the motion to conform will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, the amended bill is before us. There's a motion to report with an amendment and duly second a discussion on that motion. Hearing none members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine. Senate Bill 1390, as amended, reports on a vote of 17 to 1 with an extension. The next measure we have is Senate Bill 1416, which is uh, Senator Newman's Investment of Public Funds Act. Uh, this is identical to House Bill I don't have a, quite the full number there, but 21005, Delegate Byron. Uh, this would be an investment of public funds uh, in the Virginia Investment Pool Trust Fund. You will recall we did uh, discuss it at, this at some length when it came to us in the House version. Uh, Delegate Byron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, two, two things. Um, there is a little change in this bill, and um, the change is going to take place in my bill and the Senate as well, that corrected a problem um, in the bill that now authorizes the Treasurer to invest and participate in the management of the trust, um, which is um, which is normal activity for them. And second, um, just under those counts, it's that there needs to be an amendment or are we okay as it is? I had, somehow I had the sense that there was an amendment that had been put on. It's already on here, but I just told you what the difference was. Yeah. Mine is going to be amended. Right, there's a motion to, a, to uh, re uh, report Senate Bill 1416, which uh, uh, identity <laughs> made between <laughs> this and the House cognate. All right, motion and a second. Report Senate Bill 1416. Is there discussion on that? Right, members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine. Is it still Alright, the clerk will close the roll. Senate Bill 1416 reports on a vote of 16 to 2. Senate Bill 1470. This is Senator Chafin on the coal tax credits. Uh, this is uh, an extension of the coal tax credits, or uh, some would say that it's a renewal of a, a credit which lapsed last month. Uh, however, you prefer to view that, uh, it is uh, an extension of the coal tax credits. There was a pretty sharp uh, divide in both chambers on this, so you will want to attention uh, the tax credit. The Senate Bill 1470. It's a pleasure to meet you. All right, there's a motion to report. Is there a second? And a second. Discussion? Hearing none, members will indicate their vote on Senate Bill 1470 on the electronic voting machine. <laughs> Senate Bill 
1470 reports on voters, 15 for five. All right, and then Delegate Blossom, we are we have uh, Senate Bill 1034, Senator Howell, which is similar but not identical. <coughs> Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to inform that to the version that left the House. Um, I think in the Senate they put a sunset on it, and I'd like to remove that. Right. Here's the uh, suggestion. There's a motion and a second to conform the Senate version of, of uh, on the historic tax credits to the House version. All right, motion and second. Is there discussion on that motion? I'm hearing non members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine. Second to report uh, Senate Bill 804. Discussion on that? None members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine.
certainly, uh, I guess, time means everything in life. I certainly didn't expect to be able to walk into the room and make the statement, uh, something to the effect that I made in subcommittee, that uh, this undercutting of the county's ability to manage its own financial affairs is extremely frustrating. Every city can adopt and can increase their food tax as well as other taxes. The ability to pay of a city does, uh, when it comes to school funding does not take into account that financial ability. So you have counties, particularly urban counties, such as I represent with 1.2 million people operating as if it was still back in the 1700s with only the real estate tax. That I cannot vote for any continued uh, chipping away at what is already makes no sense in today's economy and in our structure of government and our service to all the people of the Commonwealth. And uh, therefore, I will continue to to vote no, and you'll hear another variation of this speech on the House floor. Okay. Any further conversation? Bill, uh, you go just quickly. I mean, it, it, the subcommittee, the, the business community came out in full force uh, asking that this be passed as is with the recommendations that were set up in the amendment. Uh, so, I, it was an overwhelming recommendation of the subcommittee to report eight to one, and I'm so moved. There's a motion and uh, there has been a second to report with the amendment. <coughs> Further discussion? Members will indicate their vote. Next up, Senate Bill 1320. Uh, this was from Senator Carrico. It authorizes Washington County uh, to impose a tax on the admissions to a multi sports complex and entertainment venue in that region. This was uh, discussed at length. This was important to that southwest portion uh, region of the state. Uh, there's no impact on the Commonwealth. Uh, potential. Uh, on the locality for permissive gain for Washington County. There were no amendments, and it was a recommendation of the subcommittee to report nine to one, and I'm so moved. Motion and a second to report Senate Bill 1320. Discussion? Aye. Members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine. Senate Bill 1350 uh, from Senator Deeb. Yeah, this actually just kind of a clarification allows the purchaser to be refunded any motor vehicle sales and use tax paid if the vehicle is returned and the purchase price refunded uh, due to mechanical defect or, or failure. Apparently, in the past, if you had a problem and the car was sent back, you wouldn't get the tax back. This seems like a fairness issue to clarify. Uh, it's de minimis to the state. Uh, none on the local. There were no amendments. It was discussed at fully in the subcommittee. The recommendation of the subcommittee to report nine to zero. Report Senate Bill 1350. Uh, any discussion on that? If not, members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine.
Chairman, actually, if I may, we can actually do it one of two ways. We have a substitute that includes uh, a substitute to 1165 that includes the ORAC bill on the education side, but mine, as far as including past forms on the other two. Okay, never mind. Okay. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll just go with a recommendation of the Senate for the committee, and I'm happy to take it from there. Nice to have you back with us. Great to be back, Mr. Chairman. All right. Proud to help. So, that's okay. Done. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, my measure, uh, which passed the House, I believe, with just one negative vote, uh, there have been some questions that arose, and I don't want to put the senator's me uh, measure uh, in jeopardy or even have to make it go to conference to unwrap the axle. They're not in conflict. I think we'd be in a better posture. Uh, let his go through as it is. I'm probably going to be doing a Section 1 substitute for my bill over there, which his will lay a good groundwork for, then what mine will come in and direct the department to do on top of it. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll not unwrap the axle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the motion was to report Senate Bill 1165. Discussion? Mr. Chairman? Uh, yeah, I believe. <laughs> okay. 
down, down here. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, just I, I had asked council when we came out of subcommittee uh, because I was a little concerned, and I, and I don't know if you've gotten clarification on this. Delegate Farrell also had a bill in this same section of the code that talked about the reallocation annually. And I, I, did, is that was that a conflict? I, I didn't because remember I asked if you would if, if you would check and see if there was any conflict in that. Is there any conflict in that, or do we? Not with this one, but for our last two, we made the same adjustment. And we had to substitute for that. Okay, very very good. Okay, wrong 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 bill. Yeah. Okay, we got that. Never mind. Thank you. Sure. All right. Motion is to report 1165. Uh, members will indicate their vote on an electronic voting board. <coughs> Clerk will close the roll. Senate Bill 1165 reports on a vote of 20 to 1. All right, and then uh, Delegate Klein. Mr. Chairman, the next bill is also Senator's Success Bill 1168, uh, reorganizing the provisions of the NAP tax credit program. Setting out separate sections for portions administered by social services and education. Um, doesn't make any changes to the existing program, but as was indicated, may uh, need to have a substitute to account for Delegate Farrell's bill that's moving through. So uh, I just uh, at this point move the committee substitute. Is it being distributed? on that motion? Members will indicate uh, those in favor of adopting the substitute on Senate Bill 1168 indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right, that substitute before us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the original bill was recommended for reporting 10 to nothing by the subcommittee. I would do the same for the bill as amended. Right. Senate Bill 1168 Substitute is recommended for reporting. Uh, so the senator is good with the substitute. Patron is in support. The motion is to report the substitute. Uh, delegate Byron. Um, the senator's staff, is this, is her, oh, I mean, you've got a substitute in front of her. Is there any, what are the major highlights or changes? Can you just say real quick? <coughs> Actually, I can. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, under Peter Farrell's bill, it looked at saying that um, eliminating the 10% for new um, applicants, so which would, in other words, in other words, cut everybody who had previously applied. What this does, adopting um, Peter's substitute into it, is it says only you, that only applies if you get more than 10% increase to the amount of funds or credits available to the program itself. So my bill truly just um, separated the two sections out, social services and education, and simplified the way it was throughout the code so it was easier to go through whether you're applying on one side or the other, easily understood it and could apply without having any confusion or mixing up applying for one side or the other side of it. So ad adapting, adopting his into it, and I'm pretty sure his will fly through the Senate as well, not that really. Um, it, it truly just makes it easier when it gets approved to implement um, that that bill or that section of the code. Okay. Answer your question. There's no harm to my bill, and you know the benefits. You know, it's just it's just there. Tell your client. And Mr. Chairman, if if uh, Delegate Farrell's bill runs into trouble in the Senate, we I don't think there'd be any problem with that unraveling. Piece of cake. Strip out of that. Yeah. Your bill go on out. Further discussion? All right, members will indicate their vote on Senate Bill 1168. Close the roll. Senate Bill 1168 as amended reports on Bill 2021. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for your time.
Governor Klein, if you would suspend for just a moment. I see Senator Hanger has been waiting patiently in our uh, uh, room, and I certainly very passed. We've passed most of them. We do have, uh, there are several uh, measures for Senator Hanger that, that he has brought to us that have passed. There is one <coughs> remaining, and that is the one that reported out of uh, Subcommittee 3, Delegate Byron. So if you want to simply mention Delegate Byron, what the subcommittee did, and then Senator Hanger. Okay. Senator Stanley, welcome to uh, 
I'll tell you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it's nice to meet you here. Uh, if you can, for just a moment, close your eyes and imagine that Delegate Massey did not carry this belt, and maybe we can move forward in a manner which is consistent with the intent of the bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's possible you can do it. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, basically what this does is it expands uh, the definition um, of who may be eligible for um, a tax credit scholarship uh, for eligible pre-kindergarten pre -kindergarten children. Uh, these are pre-kindergarten children who are currently enrolled in a non-public pre-kindergarten uh, program <coughs> who are at-risk children, at-risk four-year-olds, unserved by the Head Start programs. Uh, they're in a family who who's, does not have an annual household income in excess of 300% or the current poverty guidelines of 400%. In cases where the individual, the, the child has an IEP that's been written and finalized for the child, um, is a child of a homeless family, or has a parent or guardian who did not graduate from high school. Basically, in our area, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, of course, we don't have universal pre-K, and a lot of our children living at or below the poverty level are being unserved and not getting an education. This is our opportunity to grab those as those children at this time who are at risk. <coughs> and who are not being helped by Head Start, who may be homeless, who this very ability for us to provide these scholarships um, to these children may provide them with their only meal of the day, or their only guidance of the day. And so what this simply tries to do is not, it does not cost the state any more money. It expands the, the eligible pool for these scholarships. It does not raise any more money, uh, require any more money. The, that education scholarship right now is under used and so therefore what we're trying to capture is enough of these at-risk four-year-olds uh, so that we can put them on the path of doing something uh, that will be beneficial because ultimately what we see in our area is that one out of three children in my district live at or below the poverty level which means they never have a chance either at the American dream or a good education so what this tries to do is capture those in very special and very distinct circumstances not generally but in the ones that I've just stated where they're most at risk, where we can where we can save these children, and give them a chance with good education, put them on the right path. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Imaginatively, we were able to note that this is a completely new bill. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for discussion on this, are there any questions for Senator Shannon? All right, what's the pleasure of the committee? We have the, the recommendation. We've got a motion to report Senate Bill 1427, and there were no amendments on that, I believe, so any discussion? Hearing none, members will indicate their vote on the electronic vote. Motion. Motion to report. All members voted. Please report. What is the roll? Senate Bill 1427. You didn't close your eyes long enough. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. All right. Uh, Delia Cody, thank you for joining uh, us as chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two more in our committee. The first was Senate Bill 1286, Senator Urban James Bill, Land Preservation Tax Credits for Holding Tax of Non Resident Elders. Allows a pass through entity to claim a land preservation tax credit against the taxes withheld on the Virginia source income of a non resident owner of the entity. The use of such credit against the withholding tax by the pass through entity would not be subject to the 2% transfer fee. Um, the recommendation from the subcommittee was to report 10 to nothing, and I so move. The motion was to report Senate Bill 1286. Discussion? Hearing none, members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting board. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, did uh, Delaware get uh, blocks? Um? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I want to clarify the law. Uh, got questions about the bill to a state. Non resident, we're, we're going to lose what, 2% of the transfer fee? Is that, is that, can you explain that to me again? I couldn't hear you. All right, let me, let me see if staff can give us a rendition on that or answer your question. So if you say your question one more time. We'll yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Um, the way I read this is 
that the 2% transfer fee is what we would be losing, and this is for non-residents of Virginia, and DTR would have to pick up the, the extra expense. And actually, I see taxes here. They may be able to uh, clarify on that, Delia Blossom. Mr. Chairman, Kristen Collins from the Department of Taxation. Um, Delia Blossom is correct. Under this bill, non-residents um, that are otherwise subject to the 2% transfer fee would no longer be subject to the transfer fee. Residents would continue to be subject to it. Delia Blossom. some clarification on this the uh, the the reason that it's there is this is only for a non-resident owner of a past a Virginia pass-through entity like an S Corp or an LLC and if it's a Virginia resident they're not subject to the withholding in that pass-through entity but they are if they're a non-resident so Virginia residents would never be subject to this tax and if a Virginia resident wanted to take advantage of the tax credits they wouldn't buy it through their own corporation. They would buy it individually and use it on individual taxes. But you can't do that when you're a non-resident owner of that same LLC. And is that, uh, is that how you would? Mr. Chairman, um, the, the non-resident owners, um, Delegate Head is correct, the non-resident owners are the only ones that are subject to the withholding, um, PT withholding requirement. However, resident owners are going to have to pay estimated taxes or employee withholding or something along those lines. So they both ultimately end up claiming the credit on their in their Virginia income tax returns. It's just a different mechanism of capturing the, the tax. Delegate Ferris. I'm still confused. Why why are we doing this? Uh, I think Prince Senator Owen Shane brought us a bill, so we're <laughs> <laughs> Notice maybe someone that's Mr. Chairman that may be smarter than I am at taxes shaking his head at delegate heads uh, presentation about this bill. Yes, you, you know I think given the givens, uh, oh, go ahead, tax. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, to, to answer your question about why this bill is here, this is to to address a very unique situation. Um, in which somebody wanted to, uh, an S corporation purchased a tax credit and they wanted to use it for um, the non-resident withholding obligations. And um, that's a pretty unique situation. I don't think we've ever seen anything else that's fallen into this bucket. The majority of the um, transfers from past through entities are to, to resident owners. Um, uh, maybe an LLC would earn the credit and then they would pass it through to the resident owners. That's the more typical situation. I, I, I hear just enough uh, friction here that I think we will uh, take this by temporarily. I've sent it to, uh, to Senator Obenshane's office, and uh, I'd like to have him here before we went further on that. Chairing courts. Chairing courts, okay. Okay. Right. Nonetheless, I think I'd like to give him the option if we can, if we can do that. So, Doug Fogey, if you would continue on. Yes. The next bill was Senate Bill 1328. Senator Carrico, Enter Enterprise Zone Grants and Tax Credits, Qualified Real Property Improvement Expenditures, provides that an expenditure for an improvement to real property may qualify for a grant or tax credit regardless of whether it is capitalized or deducted as a business expense under federal treasury regulations. The recommendation from the committee was to report 9 to 1 and I so move. Senate Bill 1328. Discussion? Uh, Delegate Orr. Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, I wasn't able to be in the subcommittee. My only question so, the long and the short as I read this effect, it allows them, for lack of a better way to put it, to double dip. That they can claim it as a deduction or capitalize it under their federal taxes, but still qualify for a grant or tax credit under Virginia tax provisions. Would that be correct? Uh, let's see if tax can give us a, a response. 
Mr. Chairman, Kristen Collins from the Tax Department again. Now, this bill is intended to address a change in the federal rules as to what needed to be capitalized versus deducted. Um, our understanding is some of the companies that were benefiting from the grant program um, fell into that federal change, and this is just a, attempting to address that issue. Motion is to report Senate Bill 1328. Further discussion? This will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine. Interstate tax reciprocity applies so that when a Virginia resident buys from out of state of an out of state dealer, the purchaser will be required to pay the tax to obtain a, a title. Since almost all higher cost ABVs and motorcycles are financed, the selling dealer will collect the tax and send it to Virginia. Senate Bill 1186 set the titling tax rates for ABVs, etc., at the general sales tax rate, including the regional rates. Tax Department fiscal impact statement shows that the bill will generate roughly about $350,000 per year for the Commonwealth without raising any tax rates. It, this, it does this by preventing purchasers from evading the Virginia tax. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mark Flynn is here today representing the industry. Should you have any specific questions? Uh, this was vetted in the Senate, and I guess I should not say that it came out unanimously there because this is a Different body, and I wouldn't want to insult the ability to address this. I humbly say that Mr. Flynn is here, and the department, uh, DMV, have with their technical amendments, there is peace in the valley. But if you have questions, Mr. Flynn is here, but this is one that raises, captures um, dollars that we would be losing. Thank you, Senator Jansen. Thank you for the recognition of the distinct chamber. All right, uh, Delegate Orock, I believe. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, it's may Roz or Mark, whichever, to tell me how the net effect of this isn't that if I go to my tractor supply there in Fredericksburg and I buy one of their ATV units, I will pay a higher tax if this passes, correct? No. Uh, no, no, no. Mark Clem, Nevada Strategy. Sorry, I'm representing the Motor Virginia Motorcycle Real Estate Exchange. If you can get no, right into the microphone so everybody can hear you. Uh, no, sir. It, it actually is exactly the same tax rates that you would have today. So no increase in taxes whatsoever. Mr. Chairman, follow-up? All righty, then since these don't have to be titled under Virginia law, what does this do? Um, under, it still it will impose the uh, motor vehicle titling tax, but at the same rates as the sales tax. And so for those vehicles that you that there's no title, and in fact, as I was checking with uh, the motorcycle dealers, they have 
They actually have MSOs for the, even their small motorcycles, little kids' motorcycles and ATVs, uh, that they actually issue MSOs to give you the opportunity for a title. And the first part of that, obviously, was was to uh, help your vehicle not get stolen because of, you can, it's an additional bonus. not going to be making anything be titled as a result of this that currently is not. Correct. That's correct. That'll be blocked. I have a tech question. <coughs> so, I guess I'm confused. I was thinking that this, you have to get a title to DMV to pay your sales tax at DMV. Is that correct? I'm trying to work through the process. Right. Um, well, for a casual sale, or if I sell a motorcycle to one of these to you, then you, if you want to get a title, you take it to DMV and get the title and pay the tax. Um, for a motorcycle dealer, and we're, we're discovering that the dealers tell me that the vast majority of the sales of these classes of, um, of vehicles are financed and they collect all of the taxes up front just like uh, they do on a regular motorcycle. So um, so the the impact is that it just, it just makes it a titling tax instead of a sales tax. those questions of the motorcycle dealers, they intent, their intent was to collect the tax on the front end and, and send it to DMV with the application for title. Follow question. Doug Blackson. So, so on the um, transfer between individuals then, or I, I guess I'll take, take it a step further, I'm sorry. If DMV gets the title, they send me a title, then they, I assume, will be just like my car, <coughs> send it to the locality, and therefore it's going to show up on my personal property. Yes, sir. have to, yes sir, uh, because in a, if, the, if the purchaser doesn't title it, it is going to show up on, on your records. Yes sir, thank, thank you. Let me pray this. Thank you Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to make sure again, I understand this correctly, because it sounds to me like what currently happens is that if I don't want to pay the tax, <coughs> I can go out of state, I can buy this vehicle or whatnot, and technically I've pay, paid less because obviously I don't have to tax it. This sounds like what we're trying to do is capture that in state, and, and again, I understand why our own our own dealerships and whatnot would want this. I think what my problem is is that once again, instead of lowering taxes in order to make it more cost competitive, we're trying to essentially, and we're not calling it a tax increase, but that is the effect: is I'm paying more for something that I lowered yesterday after this passing. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I guess the the answer is that that we all encourage tax uh, avoidance. That is lowering our taxes as much as possible. But what this deals with is tax evasion, where this, today this is a tax that, that is clearly owed. When, when I go out of state and buy the motorcycle, I should be paying the use tax. Um, but, but what happens is purchasers evade that tax, and it's to the it's to the tune of $5 million a year in lost sales, according to the manufacturers gave information to my dealers. Uh, $5 million a year, and these are these are small businesses that are generally family owned. Um, been in, some of them been in the same family for two or three generations. And so it's just, it's uh, trying to protect them so that they are competitive with the other out of state uh, dealers. And so I think overall, the truck's a pretty fair balance for that. So I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman. Doug Marshall. Doug Marshall. Isn't it correct that the motor vehicle tax? Is a portion out for road construction? 
Uh, this, the motor vehicle tax is, but this under this bill, it is distributed as the, as though it was a the sales and use tax. So part does go for transportation, the, ge the general fund, the, the, the full array of uh, uh, entities receive the distribution just as it is today before this bill passes. Mr. Chair. Okay, Marshall. So we're taking a tax that is collected in order to maintain or construct roads, but we're applying it to vehicles that don't go on the public roads. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, today, before this legislation, the taxes collected on these classes of vehicles go into the general fund to the localities under the regional tax to park for the transportation fund that whole array of distributions that's the law today and this bill actually just preserves the very same thing um, so that it, it does not the, the money derived from these vehicles which are not used in the roads uh, do not go only to transportation but instead are distributed general fund as, as though it was a general sales and use so, if I'm Mr. Chairman, it makes this makes no real no change in the policy of the distribution of the funds from it is from what it is today. It increases no there are no increases in tax rates, the same tax rates as today. Uh, it just helps our small businesses stay competitive. Tell me more. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, and I will wake Mark Haskins up out there. <laughs> <laughs> and and if you and Mark win the tag team, whatever on this. It, if, if I'm understanding what we're trying to get at is the fact that there's an unfair business climate if I have a dealership on the Virginia side of the line compared to North Carolina, whatever, and we're trying to catch that differential in how North Carolina taxes these items and then what is, quote, supposedly due in Virginia. But, Paskins, I, I ask you to come up. Are there similar discrepancies in other vehicle tax policies you know, cars, trucks, whatever, between our border states. Because if that's the driving factor, you know, that, that's kind of the, the nature of business if you operate a business on a border jurisdiction. Mr. Chairman of uh, uh, the Department of Taxation, uh, I believe that from my understanding of the issue, and we've been working on this with DMV and the um, off-road dealers for the last 10 years, trying to come up with a solution. And I think the problem is that they are subject to a retail sales tax instead of a titling tax for the surrounding states. Title is a titling tax, charge is a titling tax. But what this does, I think it puts us on the same level playing field as the other states. I don't think you have this going on with cars. Cars are subject to a titling tax in Virginia as they are in West Virginia and North Carolina. And what you have going on here, these vehicles where they're subject to a titling tax in other states were subject to a retail sales tax in Virginia. That created the problem for the small business. Uh, to, to borrow, maybe I shouldn't borrow from Senator Stanley, uh, saying to close your eyes, uh, that didn't bode so well for him. But this morning, uh, but, but it, what, what, what we're doing here is basically is changing the name of a tax in order to, to resolve this problem with reciprocity. Right now, they pay the retail sales tax at the 5.3 or 6 percent, the money goes in that distribution pot. In the future, it's going to be called a titling tax, but it's going to be at the same rates and go into the same pot, but it would resolve the issue and the revenue stays in the right places as it is today. Okay, Mr. Chairman, if you have any follow-up for any of the three. Okay, so, and, and simple-minded, walk me through this. If, if I live on the Virginia side of Bristol, but I go over on the Tennessee side to buy a vehicle, an ATV, a moped, whatever. Tell me the difference as a res right now before we do this, if you would. Well, Tell me what I'm going to pay and how I'm, I'm doping the state of Virginia out of money. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and one clarification is that this isn't just for the, like a Bristol, Virginia motorcycle dealer. I found out that the Fredericksburg dealers were losing a good bit of sales, a lot of sales under the same thing because these are uh, the side-by-sides uh, are $15,000 and be $15,000 and that's $750 in taxes that, that a person can save by going over to West Virginia or North Carolina or wherever. Uh, but 
today, uh, the the Tennessee dealer will not honor our tax. Normally, the, a fifteen thousand dollar ATV typically gets fin financed anymore. It's not a lot of these sales are not financed, and so today the the Tennessee dealer does not honor our tax because it is not a titling tax like they have, and as a result, they don't charge it. it the person I go down and. I go into Tennessee, and the first one, first one, Virginia goes to Tennessee, buys it, brings it back, and never pays the sales and use tax because that's tax evasion. Um, you know, on our tax returns, we have you're supposed to report under the use tax what you bought out of state. Um, so with this bill, then the the Tennessee dealer will see, oh, it's the same tax in Virginia. We honor reciprocity, and on especially on a finance sale, which is the vast majority then the Tennessee dealer will collect and remit to Virginia that tax on that vehicle. Other buyers. Um, <coughs> I have a question in regards to um, other taxes. How does this affect um, personal property tax? Is there a personal property tax on this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Kelly Byron, uh, it's, it, there's a personal, pro most localities impose personal property tax all these vehicles, and that's not going to change under this. All right, the, uh, you've heard the bill. Further conversation on Senate Bill 1186. Senator Vance, any final words that you, you have for us? I think between these two gentlemen, they've answered your questions, and um, I hope you will think kindly of this bill. Senate Bill 1186, uh, we adopted the line amendments that were technical in nature. What's the pleasure of the committee on Senate Bill 1186? Move to report. Second. second. Motion to second to report Senate Bill 1186 as amended. Discussion on the motion. Members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine. All members voted to care to vote. The clerk will close the roll. Senate Bill 1186 fails to report. Thank you. Uh, Senator Obergine, thanks for your patience. Sure. I know you were here the full morning. We had a little bit of conversation about your bill, and, and it, I thought it would be better if you were here to, to make the presentation. I'm delighted anytime I start talking about taxation and tax issues and uh, pass through entities, I'm stretching my level of confidence, but I'm happy to come up and do the best I can. Mr. Chairman, I, my, what I would tell you, I understand the questions that were being asked and dealing with uh, whether we're treating somebody from out of state differently than somebody from in state. And it's, it, the answer to that question is basically yes. And uh, I'll tell you that context in, in which I suggest it makes sense is that I actually was the patron of the withholding bill to begin with. Uh, we were losing uh, many millions of dollars in tax revenue from owners of pass-through pass -through entities who did not live in Virginia who were not paying that tax. And uh, I guess it was seven or eight years ago I introduced that and passed it so that we could collect taxes that were actually owed uh, by out-of-state owners of these pass-through entities. And the situation that arose here is an out-of-state owner uh, of a pass-through entity who was endeavoring to meet his obligations to uh, satisfy that withholding requirement. Didn't dispute the fact that they owed it, but they're out-of-state. Uh, they don't deal with the Virginia Department of Taxation every day. Uh, the entity, as a pass-through entity, uh, doesn't owe any tax. Uh, it doesn't get any tax benefit. But uh, other states may handle this differently. The entity, in this instance, bought tax credits. And of course, the entity with a single owner, uh, you know, they thought the owner was going to get the benefit of those tax credits and learned from the Department of Tax that, wait a second, you've got to transfer the tax credits to the single owner of the LLC, and by the way, we're going to charge you 2% to do that. 
Um, they had a dispute over it. The Department of Tax wound up uh, levying on, or I guess freezing $25,000 in a bank account. It was just a mess. And uh, uh, you know, I guess I contributed to this by creating our withholding requirement, which has yielded huge benefits, collected uh, large sums of money that we otherwise that were owed to us that would have never been collected. And this is simply to ease the administration of this to prevent confusion uh, by the, these folks who are required to uh, uh, submit to our withholding requirement and choose to buy uh, land preservation tax credits. So uh, it does treat out-of-staters somewhat differently, but it's a nature, it is a, a function of the underlying rule requiring uh, withholding. Delegate Head. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, just a couple questions for the patron, if I might. I'll do my best. Um, so, currently, <laughs> what we're what you're doing here, the, the out-of-state owner of the LLC, when they <coughs> purchased those tax credits through the LLC, paid a two percent transfer tax from the original owner, did they not, to to get them into the LLC? I, yeah, I guess right. they would. So they paid that once already, and what we've got currently is because they already own the LLC, and now they're gonna transfer it in essence to themselves, so we're gonna tax them again. And that's what we're trying to eliminate with this, is that? I appreciate the generous and friendly leading question. <laughs> <laughs> is yes. We try to plant those occasionally. Uh, right, for the, for the discussion from the committee. There's a motion to report and a second <coughs> further discussion on that motion. Hearing none, members will indicate their vote on the electronic voting machine. <laughs> Clerk will close the roll. Senate Bill 1286 reports on a vote of party right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Page. I'm the Executive Director of the Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission. And yes, Senator Wagner is hung up in one of our projects, and thank you for House Bill 2313 and the creation of the Hampton Roads Transportation Fund. But construction means progress, and progress means we're healing our congestion as we move forward. Unfortunately, the Senator is in the thralls of trying to get through that. Um, Senate Bill 1456, which is in the nature of a substitute, is proposed by the Senate, which is before you today brings forth the establishment of a baseline of our uh, regional sales, uh, uh, wholesale tax on gasoline. In doing that, moving forward, it's very similar to the alignment that we had with uh, House Bill 2313 with the uh, statewide floor as well. In Hampton Roads, what that means for us is we have $3.3 billion before us for Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. By having this stabilization and the establishment of a baseline, helps us move forward with projects like that quicker. In doing that, it saves our taxpayers' costs of funds. Uh, the 2.1% gain for us is about $20 million a year. And in the establishment of looking at the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, for example, we have a $3.3 billion project, which will cost us over $4 billion due to financing and construction escalation costs due to delay of not having sufficient funds. In addition to that, at HR Tax, which is different than last year when we came to you, We've marshaled up, we have $1.5 billion, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, under construction contract with our construction partner, VDOT, as we're moving forward. So this is also dealing with the establishment of delivering these projects that we see today under construction and how we will move forward with those in a very efficient manner. And being as conservative as possible to the region's taxpayers, we at the Hampton Roads region, through the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization, who also unanimously approved and endorsed uh, this effort 
have moved forward with a project list that we will build in this community and in this region. But in doing that, as we wait, wait longer, we're looking at a 3% annual construction delay cost increase, and this 2.1% regional gas tax stabilization will assist us in saving our taxpayers <coughs> for projects in the future and delivering them sooner. Mr. Chairman, uh, we at HR TAC and HR TPO are in support of this effort, and I apologize, I don't have the courageous comments that Senator Wagner would have been, but the passion is truly there as we ourselves are moving forward with these projects, which he's hung up in right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Craig, for presenting. What I'm going to do, and I have several already who would like to ask questions, but I'm going to offer about, the issue is broadly, I think, familiar to many members of this committee, so I'm going to offer each side about five minutes to present. Um, and if there are other questions, I won't count that against your time, but uh, each side will have about five minutes in favor and then five if there is opposition. Uh, so let me begin with uh, Delegate Cole, who has a question. Yeah, I understand this bill sets a floor uh, as far as the gas price uh, in order to, since it's based on a percentage, the amount of revenue is fluctuating <coughs> greatly depending on the price of gas. What is the price of gas floor set in the bill? It's two dollars and seventeen cents, which is the February twenty three thirteen uh, uh, same same floor establishment that you would find uh, that was as assessed and assigned under House Bill twenty three thirteen for the statewide tax. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Mr. Cole? Yeah. Uh, that's significantly higher than the average gas price in my area. So this uh, really, I think, probably sets a uh, tax increase. Kind of embeds a tax increase in the uh, in the code. They'll get to work. No. Right. Uh, then let's turn to uh, uh, those who would like to. Thank you, sir. And thank you. Uh, those in favor, and I'm, as I say, I'm going to put a time limit on each side. And thank you all for being here. I know it's an uh, important measure and one that has a significant uh, interest and impact. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, happy Monday. Happy Monday. My name is Dave Snyder, member of Falls Church City Council. I've chaired all the regional transportation agencies, and I currently chair the Metropolitan Washington Emergency Preparedness Council. Uh, we speak in support of this legislation. Uh, it's fundamentally important to, to major and huge areas of the Commonwealth of Virginia, important to us in terms of maintaining a high level of transportation service, and in turn important to the rest of the Commonwealth in terms of the revenue that we provide to support others. The reality is that inaction actually imposes a tax. Without the floor, workers who rely on transit will pay more or have less service. If localities maintain the service, and we're trying to do that, they must tax their citizens to pay for it. So in essence, what you've done is shifted the tax to businesses and homeowners through the property taxes. A gas tax floor makes sure that we get revenue from drivers passing through the affected areas. So we're getting drivers from outside paying their fair share to assist us with our transportation, where what's happening now is we're actually shifting costs to other taxpayers, our residential and business taxpayers. This has meant a loss of tens of millions of dollars, not only to Hampton Roads, but to PRTC and the NBTC and it's causing us to make impossible choices between transportation, police officers, and teachers. We should not have to make that choice. We urge you to do what you did with the statewide tax, which is to restore this uh, so that we don't lose this um, very, very important revenue. So uh, again, thank you for your uh, consideration on these issues. It is of major importance to local government and to my citizens in terms of restoring fairness by uh, removing the shifting of cost to our business and homeowners that's occurring, or to low-income individuals and others who rely on transit and who either have less service or pay more as a result. So thank you very much for your consideration. Mr. Chair, members, Betty Bob Mathias from City of Virginia Beach. Uh, if Senator Wagner were here, he would say that this was an oversight when House Bill 2313 was put in. Uh, he was one of the conferees on that bill, and they just forgot to put in the floor that they put in for the state uh, for the for regional gas taxes. Uh, all the improvements in Hampton Roads are going to the interstate, which are improving the access to the port and our military. The military has been telling us for years that we need to improve our roadways. 
particularly the Hanton Roads Bridge Tunnel that uh, Mr. Page talked about. Uh, Interstate 64, uh, Interstate 664, the High Rise Bridge. We're making improvements all over the region, which are going to help the economy uh, improve. Uh, going to help the port, which is bringing in more and more. They had another record year, and a uh, record January, uh, with over 200,000 TEUs. Uh, so they're doing about 25 months in a row now of increased uh, uh, containers coming through the port, and the majority of those, about 60 percent, go out by the roadways. So this is very important. Again, it's the interstate improvements, uh, and this was an oversight. It was meant to be put in 2313, and will help us uh, borrow money and build these projects um, easier and build these projects quicker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, Rob O'Hannon of uh, Hunt and Williams on behalf of the Virginia Transportation Construction Alliance. Uh, we represent over 300 uh, companies that build and maintain Virginia's transportation network, and we support the legislation as well and know that the need is great on uh, congestion relief and, and, and improving uh, our transportation network, and I think this can help uh, solve some of those problems. Thanks. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Mike Forehand with the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce. Obviously, this uh, lack of a floor has had an impact on our region's ability to have fun, uh, appropriate funding for transit and road projects. This is very important to our region, the business community, so we support the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Amy Karen Seibert, on behalf of both the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission as well as the Virginia Railway Express. Um, lack of a regional gas tax floor affects both of our groups significantly. <coughs> MVTC um, allocates the funds for the Northern Virginia jurisdictions for their metro allocations, and then down in PRTC is where VRE gets the money. Uh, they can decide between either transportation projects or VRE for their subsidies, and so without this tax floor, we've lost about 40% uh, since 2013, which is a significant hit to both those groups. So thank you, we support the bill. Chairman, members of the committee, Phil Abraham, on behalf of the Virginia Association for Commercial Real Estate and the Old Dominion Highway Contractors Association, for the reasons stated, we support this bill. Thank you. Mr. Chairman of the committee, Tracy Bain, on behalf of the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, for all the reasons you've heard, we support this bill. Thank you for your brevity. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Noel Dominguez of Fairfax County, we also support this bill. Our funding goes directly to Metro, so that has been a reduction of about $10 million annually um, that we do receive in these taxes. Thank you very much. Last word, we'll go right here, and after that, we'll take some uh, just shows of hands. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, very quickly, John Easter, Chamber RVA. Just thought it was important to note that uh, as an entity that's not in Hampton Roads in Northern Virginia, we think this is important to the state being able to meet its overall objectives, and so we do support the bill. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your understanding, those of you that have not had a chance to speak. But if you're in favor, you can simply indicate by raising your hand. Or Uh, is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition to this measure? All right, what's the pleasure of the, sub of the committee? Move to lay the bill on the table. Second, lay the bill on the table. That is non-debatable. Those in favor of the motion to lay on the table will indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. no. Bill is laid on the table. Uh, completes the work of the committee. Thank you to all of you for uh, hanging in there and 